When Eric Bischoff decided to create the New World Order faction within professional wrestling, he never envisioned the faction having a true ending. He of course knew in the back of his mind that one day it would all come to a close because really everything has to come to an end eventually, especially within the professional wrestling landscape. When Ted Turner requested an additional WCW TV show for his network however, any ideas of ending the NWO faction were completely forgotten about. It simply was no longer an option for consideration. WCW Thunder on Thursday nights created an incredible problem for Eric Bischoff in WCW wrestling. Not only was Eric stretched to his limits with Nitro and his energy sopping rivalry with Vince McMahon and the World Wrestling Federation, but Bischoff was dealing with a tremendous amount of big name talent. He was keeping egos in check, trying to keep creative in some sort of order, keeping WCW profitable. And I really do believe that Eric Bischoff sometimes doesn't get enough credit for for the work he undertook during the Monday Night Wars. With the creation of Thunder though, Eric had a few ideas, a few plans that were actually pretty radical in terms of originality. Eric wanted to make Thunder a strict World Championship Wrestling show and he wanted to change WCW Monday Nitro to NWO Monday Nitro. You can see why any thoughts of wrapping up the New World Order storyline were completely out of the question. Eric Bischoff said, the NWO were supposed to take over Nitro and WCW were going to have Thunder. That was the strategy. The strategy wasn't to put an end to the NWO. The strategy was, how do I create NWO to be its own unique and distinct brand and its own show? There was never a desire to put an end to the NWO, there was never a reason to put an end to it. There was a desire and reason to try and build it as its own brand so it could sustain a kind of brand position within a WCW program. When the Thunder discussions began happening, any thoughts of how do we end the NWO storyline went out the window and it became more like, okay, we have this juggernaut called the NWO, how do we best take advantage of it and how do we best utilise it? The decision was made for NWO to get Nitro and WCW gets Thunder. That was the goal. When it comes to the success of WCW during those fabled 83 weeks of the Monday Night War, it's ridiculous to downplay how important the New World Order really was. We all know that Kevin Nash, Scott Hall and Hollywood Hogan had their own agendas, no one is arguing that, but that doesn't mean the storyline wasn't a success, it was a massive success, even with the weird booking, the indecisive match finishes, the fact that the NWO put a limited amount of superstars over, the New World Order were still the hottest thing in wrestling. The NWO though were also so far removed from the traditions of World Championship Wrestling and the company's roots in Georgia, there was still old school fans of WCW who felt that the NWO was nothing more than a bunch of New York guys coming in and collecting a paycheck, and there's also a lot of truth to that. During the glory days of the Monday Night War, you had guys like Ric Flair and the Horsemen and Sting who would fight for the traditions of World Championship Wrestling, and plenty of fans got behind their old favourites. Noticing that fans were effectively cheering for both the NWO and the babyfaces of WCW, and noticing that the NWO branding held a lot of weight during the mid to late 90s, Eric Bischoff's initial knee-jerk reaction was to change WCW Nitro to NWO Nitro. A lot of people, including the wrestling media, criticise Eric Bischoff for this move, but when the common complaints of modern wrestling always centre around everything being the same and wrestling having a real lack of originality these days, well Eric Bischoff's idea should be at least praised for being very outside the box and something completely different. It was a ballsy move, Eric truly felt that the popularity of the NWO could sustain a weekly show and traditional fans of World Championship Wrestling could be kept happy with a WCW exclusive show known as Thunder. We can only assume that there'd be crossovers between both shows and it's all very hypothetical in terms of how this would work. We can only guess what was going to happen, but fortunately there was a test run of NWO Nitro that aired on TNT and today we're going to take a look at this broadcast to see how it all went down. 
The very first episode of WCW Thunder took place on January 8th, 1998, and the pilot episode of NWO Nitro happened just two weeks prior. At the time, WCW Nitro was a three-hour broadcast, and to try and ease viewers into this new wrestling experience, the decision was made to air a more traditional first hour of WCW action before transforming the show for the final two hours. It all happened on December 22nd, 1997, six days before WCW's biggest grossing show in history, Starcade 97. You have to believe too that this was strategic. To give credit, the whole Sting vs Hogan angle had been built up very, very well, and WCW had a serious amount of viewership going into Starcade. Putting on NWO Nitro before Starcade would expose an insane amount of fans to this new directive, and it would also provide WCW with an incredible amount of feedback. Eric also really did believe that fans would enjoy it. He felt the new world order was established enough to take over an entire TV show, and keep in mind that this was 11 months after the ill-fated NWO sold out pay-per-view. Whether Eric had more faith in his creation at this point, who knows, but at the end of the day, Eric had to try and do something. The Thunder program was a huge headache that wouldn't go away, so Bischoff was seriously hoping that fans would buy into NWO Nitro as the future of his flagship Monday Night Wrestling show. And as ballsy as this move was, you can't help but thinking back to sold out in January and how badly that pay-per-view was received. The show kicks off with the Nitro Girls doing a dance routine as Tony Schiavone announces that Eric Bischoff has some sort of surprises in store tonight. That's right, NWO Nitro was just completely sprung on the fans, there was no announcement, it wasn't advertised at all, and this too was a strategic move. WCW Nitro was already a proven success with a track record of high viewership. Announcing a change this big could have potentially hurt that viewership, so while it was a little sneaky, it also made sense to test this out in front of a regular WCW viewing audience. Now, that's not to say that a complete NWO takeover of Nitro wasn't hinted at or mentioned in storylines, it very much was. Eric Bischoff was wrestling Larry Zbysko at Starcade 97, and if Bischoff won, the NWO would gain full control of Nitro. So, the concept of a new Nitro broadcast with the New World Order was definitely a proposition, at least in storylines. The first 60 minutes of this Nitro, though, was pretty standard. The commentary team done a lot of work to build up Starcade. We had Eddie Guerrero vs Fit Finley, Ming vs Steve McMichael, Van Hammer vs Chris Benoit. We had promos from The Giant and Dallas Page, all seemed pretty standard. After the Benoit match, NWO members Rick Rude, Buff Bagwell, Vincent, Scott Norton and Conan paid a visit to the commentary desk. Shivani, Mike Tanay and Larry Zbysko disappeared, and the NWO began handing out New World Order t-shirts to the production staff, some of which couldn't act to save their lives, a few were seen smiling at this hostile takeover. The NWO made the production crew remove WCW Nitro logos away from the set, Conan went into the production truck and he gave out more NWO shirts while asking if the staff were with the NWO or not. Basically, the New World Order were bullying people into doing their dirty work. Even the arena banners were taken down and NWO Nitro banners were used as replacements. This was pretty cool, but I do have two small complaints. The first being that really, it should have been Hall, Nash and Hogan calling the shots here. And also, the whole dismantling of the Nitro set went on for over 10 minutes. Doesn't sound like much I know, but it seems like an eternity when you're watching it. To end the rebranding of Monday Nitro, a giant metal block with the NWO Nitro logo gets lowered down from the ceiling, covering the entranceway. And then, a new intro is played for the NWO portion of the show. The intro shows an unnamed man destroying the WCW Nitro logo and replacing it with the new NWO version, and we see grainy clips of the New World Order in action. The destruction of the classic Nitro set is pretty much what everyone remembers about this episode of Nitro, so now that we've got that out of the way, let's take a look at the remainder of the show. 
The first segment is, of course, an NWO promo. Eric Bischoff comes down to the ring riding a motorcycle, and Eric welcomes the fans to NWO Nitro. Eric then introduces the New World Order, a long entrance takes place, and Bischoff announces that he has some early Christmas presents for Hulk Hogan. As NWO Nitro propaganda falls from the ceiling, not one but two motorcycles are delivered to the Hulkster. Hogan is overjoyed, he can't believe what the NWO have done for him. That's not all though, Hollywood Hogan gets a convertible limousine, hot tub and women included. Rick Steiner was then scheduled to face Scott Norton in a one on one match. JJ Dillon tells Rick that he doesn't need to go out there and perform, but Rick and his manager Ted DiBiase decide to go ahead with the matchup. The Steiner's music plays in the arena as Eric Bischoff, Rick Rude and Kevin Nash take over on commentary duties, and we see a replay from last week's action. You can see here that the replays use that grainy black and white NWO filter, WCW trying to make this Nitro feel different in every way possible. A new screen overlay is used to introduce the competitors, and during the match we can hear the voice of Neil Pruitt with his classic New World Order sound bites, very reminiscent of NWO Soul out here. The match ends in a disqualification when Conan gets involved, Scotty Steiner ends up helping brother Rick, Vincent and Ray Trailer get involved and yeah the match is over, nothing special at all here. Kevin Nash takes a little time to make fun of his upcoming opponent at Starcade, the Giant. Funnily enough, this match wouldn't happen. Nash apparently went to hospital because he feared he was suffering from a possible heart attack. Moving on, Disco Inferno comes to the ring, dancing and ripping up the NWO flyers on the floor, and he'll be facing Kurt Hennig tonight. Kurt is putting his US title on the line. When the match begins, Rick Rude says that Kurt Hennig is toying with this boy, and Eric Bischoff tells Rick to be careful, he might end up getting sued. Good stuff. Hennig pretty much dominates the entire match. The audience gets a little excited when Disco shows some signs of life, but by and large, this was incredibly one-sided. Bischoff and Nash talked about how NWO Nitro will be the new standard beginning on the 29th of December. Nash praises the video producers for putting together the intro to the show, and Bischoff says that NWO Nitro will only feature the most elite superstars of professional wrestling. The bout ends with the perfect plex, and after the match, Bobby Heenan makes his way to the commentary desk. Bobby pleads with Eric Bischoff to be part of NWO Nitro. The brand says that Eric Bischoff is a winner, the NWO are winners, and throughout his whole broadcasting career, Heenan has always been with the winning team. Eric Bischoff gets tired of Bobby's groveling and Kevin Nash ends up giving Heenan his spot on the commentary table. The next match doesn't feature any NWO guys at all, it's Harlem Heat versus The Flocks, Scotty Riggs and Lodi. Rick Rude actually takes some time to praise Booker T and Stevie Ray, kinda strange to hear but it's also refreshing. Bischoff leaves the commentary desk also during the match and Mike Tanay is brought back, so Rick Rude is the only NWO member left on commentary. Harlem Heat get the win, decent enough match, nothing more to say. Lionheart Chris Jericho takes on Buff the Stuff Bagwell next. Bagwell is his usual cocky self, while Jericho looks like he'd rather be anywhere else than on this NWO Nitro show. Still, Jericho fires up early, getting a chance to show off his athletic abilities, and this one actually turns into quite a good TV match. Jericho flies around the ring while Buff tries to slow things down on the mat. Bagwell does quite well in getting some cheap heat from the audience while Jericho continues to impress with his fast fast paced offence throughout the bout. The match ends with the blockbuster, Buff Bagwell scores the win although Chris Jericho completely carried the match from an in-ring perspective. Buff was good at getting the audience to boo him but Jericho brought the action. Next up is yet another NWO promo, the whole group comes to the ring once again to bestow more gifts on Hulk Hogan. The Hulkster gets a WCW world title ring, Easy e says that this is an exact replica by the way, and Eric even gets down on one knee to give Hogan the ring, announcing that Hogan is the champion of the world. Hogan's famous Sports Illustrated cover is displayed for all to see, along with a photo from Rocky III. Thunderlips is choking out Rocky Balboa as the audience begins chanting for Rocky. And that's another segment over, it seems that NW Nitro is all about giving presents to the Hulkster, what a great night he's having.
Next up is the NWO Nitro main event, Lex Luger vs Randy Savage, and I'm sure a lot of you who watch Reliving the War are maybe a little surprised that Luger and Savage were still feuding with each other way into late 97, but yeah, this rivalry would start and stop numerous times and the two men would make up and break up often. Randy dedicates the match to Hulk Hogan, so let's see if the Macho Man can give the Hulkster another present by defeating the Total Package. Things don't start out very well for the Macho Man as Lex Luger goes full throttle. Luger brings the fight to Savage while stopping every now and then to fluff up his hair. Honestly, Luger done this constantly during this time period and it shouldn't annoy me, but it really does. Savage is eventually able to lay in a few punches before choking Lex with his boot. The fight spills to the outside and Lex is able to to get the upper hand after fighting with Savage in the audience. Back inside the ring, Lex hits Savage with a series of clotheslines, Luger goes for the bionic elbow, and the Macho Man moves out of the way while referee Randy Anderson gets nailed. Lex fixes his hair before delivering a Gorilla Press slam, Savage hides behind Elizabeth on the outside, and this allows Buff Bagwell to hit the total package from behind. Kevin Nash ends up hitting the ring and Luger takes the jackknife, a big elbow from Randy Savage follows and the Macho Man scores the win. Really, there was no other way this match was going to end anyway, and anyone who watched main event Nitro matches that featured the NWO would know that run-ins were pretty much expected. The final segment of NWO Nitro then, take a guess who it includes. Of course, it's Eric Bischoff and Hulk Hogan once again. Three separate promos featuring these guys in one night. Granted, this was the final segment before the Starcade Hogan vs Sting match, so it made sense here, but still, it is a little too much. I suspect some people will remember this one though. The Hulkster begins talking about Starcade and how the pressure was on Sting to bring his A game for the biggest match in WCW history. Some guy brings another present to Hollywood, Eric Bischoff is confused, Easy e thinks this must be a gift from Scott Hall or Kevin Nash. Just then, Bret Hart shows up in the NWO limousine, Bret would be refereeing the Bischoff vs Sabisco match at Starcade, and Hogan then opens up his gift. It contains his own severed head. Hogan's reaction here is comical, and it's made worse by the complete silence of the audience. I think too many people were busy wondering why Bret Hart had just showed up to even care about the Hulkster standing there holding his own fucking head. Just then, Sting appears from the top of the entranceway, and the Stinger ziplines to the ring as Nitro goes off the air. We don't get to see any more, the screen fades to black as Sting approaches the ring. Tune into Starcade 1997 to see what happens next. So the experiment that was NWO Nitro was now complete, it was time to get a little feedback and see if this test run could be made into a weekly show. WCW Nitro was in the middle of their winning streak against Monday Night Raw, so no need to worry about beating the WWF in the ratings, but man, it was very close. Nitro drew a 3.5, while Raw drew a 3.1. To give some context here, the Nitro from the week prior drew a 4.1, and the Nitro that aired the week after this NWO edition scored a 4.6. Now, you also have to consider that NWO Nitro aired as fans were getting prepared for the Christmas holidays. Viewing habits would naturally change around this time of year, but WCW dropped quite close here to WWF Raw levels, and this NWO Nitro episode drew WCW's lowest rating since July of 97, when the company were typically around that 3.5 area. WCW had done well to break the 4 mark, and NW Nitro seemingly dropped them right back down. When Nitro went back to normal, they bounced right back up into the 4s, so in short, NW Nitro was not a rating success, and fans seemingly tuned out to watch WWF Raw. The moment fans tuned over to Raw was when the NWO began dismantling the Nitro set, and as mentioned earlier, I do feel that this went on way too long. Fans switched over to Raw and they didn't return, and this will get covered way down the line in the Reliving the War series on this channel, 
But over on Raw, we had the infamous Shawn Michaels vs Triple H European title match. There was a large portion of fans who wanted to see what happened with D-Generation X on this night, and not another NWO takeover, and I find that kinda interesting. Needless to say, the wrestling media didn't care much for NWO Nitro either. The Observer seems to be one of the only outlets that gets archived these days, and Uncle Dave said what we would all naturally assume, there would be a lot of second guessing around and turning WCW Nitro into NWO Nitro. So you know how the story ends really, WCW Nitro continued as it was, Zabisco defeated Bischoff at Starcade, the Sting vs Hogan match ended with controversy and things just carried on as normal. Eric rethought his Thunder strategy and he planned to give Thunder its own set of big stars, but that didn't work either, Thunder ended up becoming a C show that didn't draw very well in comparison to the Monday Night Wrestling shows. Still, as mentioned earlier, you have to respect the effort here and the philosophy around thinking outside the box. NW Nitro may not have resonated well with fans and on TV, the planning and organisation of the NW Takeover could have been handled a little better. Fans didn't really care to see the NW setting up their own entranceway and whatnot. Think about this too, if Eric did announce that the 22nd of December edition of WCW Nitro would have a complete NW theme, then there's a very high chance that fans wouldn't have tuned in to begin with and the ratings winning streak could have ended a lot earlier. So it was smart to try this unannounced, even if it did make a lot of viewers switch over. It was still a bad outcome, but it could have been way worse. I do respect the risk taking aspect of it though, keep in mind that NW Nitro was an experiment, it was a test, it may have produced bad results but at least it was something different, and it would be nice if someone out there in WWE land would try doing something different with their own product today. Thank you very much for watching.